Hello everyone, welcome back to Math with Allison. Today we're going to be working on a calculus exam, so this is Calculus 2. It is the second exam of the semester, so this is going to be a bit on the integration and also a bit on sequences and series. So let's go ahead and dive into it. You can see that this was given to the students in fall of 2016. And yes, this is a real exam, so this was given to me by a professor who I've worked with, and this is currently given out to students as study material for their upcoming exam. So let's go ahead and dive into it. We can see that this um, test is going to be six problems. So let's start with problem. Oh, look at this. Also, useful trig facts. Very nice of her to give these. Let's go ahead and start. We're going to do number one. We have the integral of x times natural log of x dx. So notice here we have two functions. When we have two functions of our variable, what we're wa going to want to use is integration by parts. So here we're going to have u equal to something, and we're going to have dv equal to something. Remember, u, we're going to go ahead and differentiate, so we're going to take the derivative in terms of x. dv, we're going to integrate in terms of x. So we want to find something that we can take the derivative of and we can integrate. I know how to take the derivative of natural log of x, and I know how to integrate x. So here we need our corresponding dx. So we get du is equal to 1 over x dx, and then we get when we integrate both sides, v is equal to 1 half x squared. If you don't remember the formula, it's going to be uv raised shooting at voodoo. Um, that's how I remember it. So here we take our u times v, natural log of x, multiplied by 1 half x squared, subtract off our v, which is 1 half x squared, times du, which is 1 over x dx. Here we can rewrite that natural log of x times 1 half x squared minus, we can bring up that scalar multiple of 1 half if you wanted, x squared times 1 over x is just equal to x. So here we can actually integrate x, right? So here we get this term just remains the same as just hanging out, right? Minus 1 half, and now we can integrate x. So we get 1 half x squared plus some constant c. If you wanted to simplify that, you totally could. We get minus 1 fourth x squared plus c. And that right there is our solution. So here we have another integral. We're going to evaluate it. We have 1 over x squared minus 4. And notice here that we can rewrite the denominator because it's a difference of squares. We get x minus 2 times x plus 2. That should cue you into partial fraction decomposition. So here we have 1 over x squared minus 4 is going to be equal to some constant a over x plus 2 plus some constant b over x minus 2. We're going to go ahead and multiply this whole thing times x plus 2 times x minus 2 so we can simplify it out. So on the left side, we get everything cancels out. We're just left with that scalar 1 is equal to a times x minus 2 because x plus 2 cancels plus b times x plus 2. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to plug in the 0. So first I'm going to plug in x is equal to 2. I get 1 is equal to, notice this term is going to go to 0 when I plug in 2, which is the purpose of doing that, right? But then we get b times 2 plus 2. So we get 1 is equal to 4b, so 1 fourth is equal to b. Now I'm also going to do that with our other 0, so here I'm going to plug in x is equal to negative 2. Here we get 1 is equal to, my a term is not going to cancel this time, so that's going to be a times negative 2 minus 2. But notice now my b term this time is going to cancel, right? So we get plus 0. That is equal to 1 negative 4a, so we get negative 1 fourth is equal to a. So now that we found what a and b are equal to, let's go ahead and replace that in the integral. So we get the integral of a, which we found to be negative 1 fourth over x plus 2, plus b, which we found to be 1 fourth over x minus 2 dx. So here we can integrate this. We get negative 1 fourth natural log of x plus 2, plus 1 fourth natural log of x minus 2, plus c. You can continue simplifying it if you want to. So you can factor out 1 fourth, and I'm going to rewrite it. So it's natural log of x minus 2 minus natural log of x plus 2, because here we're going to go ahead and use natural log property. So we get 1 fourth natural log, and that becomes x minus 2 divided by x plus 2, right, plus some constant c. You could even go further. I think at this point it's a bit unnecessary, but that's going to be the fourth root of x minus 2 over x plus 2. I don't think you need to do all that. I think you're totally fine leaving your answer like this. That would be 100% in our books, but depends on your professor, right? Here we go on to problem two. We want to evaluate the definite integral. So whenever you see cosine squared or sine squared, you're going to go ahead and use its identity. So I'm going to go ahead and replace this, 0 to pi over 4. That is 1 half 1 plus cosine of 2 theta, right? If that was sine squared of theta, the only difference was that that would be a minus, but that is the property that you're going to go ahead and use, and we have d theta. 
So you could bring out that scalar multiple of one half if you want to, and all that we're actually integrating is one plus cosine of two theta. So when we go ahead and do that, we are gonna end up with theta plus, that's gonna be sine of two theta, and you can check your work, the derivative of sine is cosine, but the derivative of sine of two theta is two times sine of two theta. So I have to divide by two, right? And then this is being evaluated between zero and pi over four. So let's go ahead and plug in upper minus lower. So some of these go to zero, which is nice. Zero goes to zero. Sine of zero is just going to be zero. So this is all that we're left with. Notice inside the sine, we have two times pi over four is just equal to pi over two, right? So let's go ahead and evaluate this a bit further. I'm going to move it up here. So we get one half times pi over four plus sine of pi over two is equal to one. So it's going to be one half. You can combine this into one fraction if you'd like. So that's going to be pi over four plus two over four. So here you get one half times pi over two plus over four, right? And then you can multiply those denominators. We get pi plus two divided by eight. And so that right there is what our integral is equal to. And actually we're gonna go ahead and use this in part B. So we're gonna evaluate the definite integral. So we get this whole thing right here. Use a substitution, x is equal to three tangent of theta to express this as an integral over theta. Use the result from part A to complete your calculation. So first, let's go ahead and set up x is equal to 3 tangent of theta. That's nice that they give you the substitution. So our little triangle oh, is terrible. That's okay. You get the idea. Our little triangle, we can represent that as x divided by 3 is equal to tangent theta. Was gonna, and x over 3 is opposite over adjacent. So we get x over 3. That means our hypotenuse is going to be the square root of x squared plus 9, right? So we have what x is equal to. We also need to find what dx is equal to. So I'm going to differentiate both sides in terms of x. So we get 1 is equal to 3 secant squared of theta times d theta over dx. And what a lot of people do is they just skip to this next step. So dx is equal to, I'm just multiplying that little dx over, 3 secant squared theta d theta. So we have our x, we have our dx, but we also need to change our bounds. So let's go ahead and set that up. We have our x bounds are 0 and 3, right? Our lower bound 0, our upper bound is 3. Let's go ahead and write those in terms of theta. So using this right here, I can find what theta is equal to by taking inverse tangent of both sides. So now we can find our new theta bounds. So inverse tangent of 0 is going to be when sine is equal to 0, and that occurs at the angle 0. Now our other one, tangent inverse tangent of 3 over 3, that's going to be 1. And that occurs when sine and cosine are the same value, which is going to be at the angle pi over 4. So now we have our new bounds. We have our x and we have our dx. So let's go ahead and replace that everywhere. So first we go from 0 to pi over 4. Nothing in the numerator changes, but now we can replace our x squared. So we have 9 plus, and I'm just going to square it right now. That's going to be 9 tangent squared of theta to the power of 2 and then multiply by our dx. That's going to be 3 secant squared of theta, d theta. So let's do some simplification right here. So in the denominator, I can factor out a 9. So here I get 9 times 1 plus tangent squared of theta. But 1 plus tangent squared of theta, that's actually an identity, and that is equal to secant squared theta. So now we have all of that to the power of 2 in the denominator, so let's just square it. We're going to get 81 secant to the power of fourth of theta. And notice here that two of these secants cancel out. So that's going to be a 2. That whole thing cancels. You can simplify the 3 and the 81. So that's going to be a 27. So let's go ahead and rewrite this now. So that's going to be 1 over 27, just bringing out that scalar multiple. 0, 2, pi over 4. 1 over secant squared theta. That's just going to be cosine squared of theta, d theta. And notice that is exactly the integral that we simplified in part A. So I know what that's equal to. That's 1 over 27, and that whole integral is pi plus 2 divided by 8. And that right there, just don't even multiply 8 and 27. Just leave it as is. Unless it's set to simplify all the way, don't do extra unnecessary simplifications because that could be where some error comes in. Moving on to problem 3, we're going to evaluate or show it's divergent. You must use the limit definition of improper integral for full credit. So this is queuing you in. This is an improper integral. And we don't have any infinities in the bounds, so what we're looking for is an illegal number. So notice in the denominator, we have x minus 3, the square root of x minus 3. If I were to plug in 3, I would be dividing by 0. So that's where it's illegal. So now we need to take the limit as a approaches 3 of, and that's going to be a to 4, 
of 5 divided by the square root of x minus 3 dx. So are we approaching 3 from the left side or the right side? Well, just look at our bounds. We're going from 3 all the way to 4, which means we're approaching 3 from the right side. So that's going to be a is approaching 3 from the right side. Now we can start evaluating this, right? So let's go ahead and evaluate the interval. We can take out that scalar multiple of 5, and that's going to be a to 4, and I'm going to rewrite this as x minus 3 to the negative 1 half, right? So here we can actually take that antiderivative. So I'm going to add 1 to the exponent, x minus 3 to the positive 1 half, divide by that new exponent, and this is being evaluated between a and 4. When we divide by 1 half, we multiply by the reciprocal, so we're going to multiply by 2. So that becomes 10, and here let's go ahead and plug in upper minus lower. So that is going to be the square root of 4 minus 3 minus the square root of a minus 3. So now think about the limit. When we approach 3 from the right side, this whole thing is going to be approaching 0. So this is equal to 10 times the square root of 1, which is just equal to 10. So since we, it equals an actual number, we evaluated it. We don't have to worry about it diverging, right? So that right there is our solution. Okay, we got some sequences. So consider the sequence generated by the recurrence relation. We have a n plus 1 is equal to a n minus 1 plus a n. And we have our first two terms already. So we want to write out the first five terms of the sequence. So we already have the first two. We have 1, 1, and then we need to find three more. So let's go ahead and find a2. a2 is going to be equal to, this is when n is equal to 1. So it's going to be a0 plus a1. That's going to be 1 plus 1, which is equal to 2. So we have our third term is 2. We have a3 is equal to a1 plus a2. That is going to be 1 plus 2, which is equal to 3. So it's going to be our fourth term, and let's go ahead and find our last term. a4 is going to be equal to a2 plus a3, which is equal to 2 plus 3, which is equal to 5. And so that right there is our next term. So that is the first five terms of the sequence. Be careful when they give you terms already, right? Don't do extra work. So state whether the sequence is increasing, decreasing, or neither. This one is actually going to be neither. We know it's not decreasing, but why is it not increasing? And that's because a0, the first term, is equal to the second term. So in order to be strictly increasing, we have to have all terms. So a n is always going to be strictly less than a n plus 1. And that is not the case with the first two terms. We have 1 is equal to 1. It doesn't get bigger. But we know that it is non-decreasing. So non-decreasing, non-increasing has a little bit looser restriction. We have a n is less than or equal to a n plus 1. And so it's okay for those two first terms to equal. But it's not going to be decreasing. None of them are going to be getting smaller, right? So is the sequence bounded? Well, no, it's not bounded because you're forever adding terms. They're going to get bigger and bigger. You can explain yourself as much as you want here. You can use other reasoning, right? But we have that we're always adding positive terms. Like on our fifth term, we're already at 5. Our next term would be 3 plus 5, which is equal to 8. So we're only going to be getting bigger and bigger, right? So let a n be the nth term of the sequence. Does the limit as n goes to infinity of our terms exist? And explain. No, it does not exist. We have that the limit as n approaches infinity of our a sub n is going to be approaching infinity. It's going to be getting larger and larger, right? Explain your answer. And we have this because the sequence is not bounded. So using this information, we can state whether the sequence converges or diverges. And it's going to diverge. And you can say by part, you know, f if you want. Just realize these are backwards. D, f, e, whatever. That's funny. Anyhow, let's go on to question five. We're going to consider the infinite series. So we have the series right here list the first three partial sums of the series. So our first partial sum is going to start at whatever our starting index is. So s sub 0 is going to be one term. It's going to be the summation from n going to 0 to 0 of 3 over 10 to the power of n, which is going to be 3 over 10 to the power of 0, which is equal to 3. Our second partial sum is going to be s sub 1. So that's going to be the summation n going from 0 to 1 of 3 over 10 to the n. So here we're going to plug in n is equal to 0 first. We get 3 over 10 to the 0 plus 3 over 10 to the power of 1. Well, that's equal to 3 plus 0 0.3, which you can rewrite as 3.3. .3. And let's go ahead and find the third one. So s sub 2 is going to be, and I'm not going to write out, you don't have to write out the summation each time. This one you could just write out as 3 over 10 to the 0 plus 3 over 10 to the first plus 3 over 10 squared, right? 
that's equal to 3 plus 0 0.3 plus 0 0.03, which you can rewrite as 3.33. So that right there is the first three partial sums of the series. What is the common ratio? Well, the common ratio is what it's being multiplied by each time, what each term is. So notice our first term is 3. Our second term is 3 tenths. Our third term is 3 to the power of 2. Our fourth term would be 3 to the power of 3, 3 over 10 to the power of 3, and then so on and so forth. Notice our terms each time are being multiplied by 1 over 10, multiplied by 1 over 10. And so that means our common ratio is going to be 1 over 10, right? So does the series converge or diverge? And how do you know? Well, our series right here, n going from 0 to infinity, can be rewritten as 3 times 1 over 10 to the power of 10. This is a geometric series with a common ratio. So we have r is equal to 1 over 10, which is strictly less than 1. So the series will converge. So now we're going to evaluate the infinite series. So the, since this is a geometric series, which it converges, it's going to converge to a over 1 minus r. a is the first term, which we know is equal to 3, 1 minus 1 tenth. That's 3 over 9 tenths, which you can rewrite that as 3 over 1 times 10 over 9. These cancel out, and we just have a 3 in the denominator. We're left with 10 over 3. So it converges to 10 thirds. Okay, and here we're on our last question. We're going to solve for y of x using separation of variables. Super fun. So separation of variables, we're going to start with our function. So dy dx is equal to 2y plus 3. The first thing I'm going to do is multiply over dx. So dy is equal to 2y plus 3 times dx. I want to get all my x's to the same side and all my y's to the same side. So I want to move this to over here. And I'm going to do that by dividing it over. 1 over 2y plus 3 times dy is equal to dx. So now that I have this separated, I'm going to integrate both sides. So on the left side, I get 1 half natural log of 2y plus 3. And on the right side, I get x plus some constant c. Pause. Before you continue simplifying, we're going to use the initial condition that y of 0 is equal to 1 half. So I'm going to go ahead and solve for c. I get natural log of 2 times 1 half plus 3 is equal to 0 plus c. So here I get 1 half natural log of 1 plus 3 is equal to c. You can continue simplifying. 1 half natural log of 4 is equal to c. Natural log of the square root of 4 is equal to c. I'm just using exponent rules. So here we get natural log of 2 is equal to c. So I'm going to move this back up here so we can continue simplifying. We get 1 half natural log of 2y plus 3 is equal to x plus natural log of 2. Now we can solve for y. So I'm going to multiply every side by 2. We get 2y plus 3 is equal to 2x plus 2 times the natural log of 2. Well, again, you can use exponent rules right here. So that's going to be natural log of 2 squared, which is equal to 4. Now we're going to have both sides raised to the power of e, right? So notice here on this left side, the e and the natural log cancel out, which is the purpose of doing that. So 2y plus 3 is equal to, we're going to use um, exponent properties here. So we have e to the 2x multiplied by e to the natural log of 4. And the same thing is going to happen right here. The e and the natural log cancel out. So all you're left with is a 4. So here we get 2y plus 3 is equal to 4e to the 2x. To get y all by itself, I'm going to first subtract over 3. So 4e to the 2x minus 3. And then I'm going to divide by 2. So y is equal to 2e to the 2x minus 3 halves. And here we have our function of y in terms of x. I think separation of variables is super fun, but to each their own. But that's all I have for us in this video today. If you enjoyed it, I have many more like it, so make sure to check out my playlist or link down below. Otherwise, please give this video a thumbs up and comment other problems or topics you'd like to see done. Thanks for watching.